All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, for anyone I don't know, um, I'm Dr. Leanne Brady, and it's my pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, and Laura, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm excited to be here also. And I'm Laura Harkin. I have a private practice in New Holland, Pennsylvania. All right. So we are going to go ahead and get started then. Um, and we want to really be able to cover some great information that you'll actually be able to take back and use in your practice, whether you're there tomorrow on a Friday or not till next week, um, but also give you a glimpse into um, what what you would get, what you'd experience, what you'd learn um, at the Institute um, in our four core series called The Essentials. You know, and people ask me all the time, you know, what's The Essentials about? And the truth of it is, um, that's a hard question to answer in a minute or two. Um, it's gonna be a hard question for Laura and I to answer in 15 minutes um, because it is four courses, each of which is multiple days. Uh, but I will tell you what my hope for is as, as uh, director of education at the Panky Institute. Um, our intention is that once you've completed all four courses in the essentials, that you will be able to examine, diagnose, treatment plan, and treatment sequence any case that comes into your office with confidence and competence. And you'll also have all the skills so that you can actually execute that dentistry if you want to. I'm, I'm confident we do that. We actually do it year over year and have for a really long time. And why would that make a difference? You know, one of the things for this webinar um, is we had happiness in the title. And so, you know, why would being able to really confidently be able to tackle any case that walks into your office um, end up in happiness or fulfillment or whatever word that you would be thinking to put with that um, and I can only give you my own answer to that after 35 years of practicing dentistry, and Laura can actually add her two cents to this, um, is that I have to tell you that one of the things I've learned after all of these years is really enjoying the practice of dentistry um, hinges on a lot of things. One, it hinges on is having the dentistry be predictable. The fewer things I run into that I don't understand, that I don't know how to make sense of, that I don't know how to fix, that I wasn't expecting, the better dentistry is every single day. The other thing for me um, is that I need dentistry to have some variation, um, some new cases that I, it isn't what I do every single day. So continuing to learn has always been a key piece of me enjoying what I'm doing in dentistry. Um, and I really do love that. Um, my practice, what I do in my office, what I know, the way I'm able to interact with patients has changed every single year for the 35 years that I've been in practice. And that is part of what keeps it exciting, right? And so how, how are we going to help you do that? Well, I'm going to go back to something, a premise um, that I actually kind of thought I learned in dental school, you know? And so I'm going to see a patient. I'm going to do that exam. I'm going to come up with a diagnosis. Um, literally in that same appointment, I'm going to say to the patient, hey, I see this, 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 and we can do this, that, and the other to change that. And they're going to say yes to that dentistry. And then off we go. And everybody's going to want me to do everything that I present. And you know what I've learned over a lot of years is that system works really, really well under certain circumstances. Um, it works really well when the dental needs are simplistic, when there's something the patient already understands and already values, when the patient already has an understanding that they have dental needs, that something isn't right with the way their health or their function or the structure of their teeth is right now. But when we start to talk about being more comprehensive, when we start to step outside the box of routine perio procedures, routine operative procedures that most of our patients have an understanding around, that process I think I learned in dental school starts to break down. And more and more and more patients patients don't say yes, they don't go schedule to do that work uh, because that ability to help the person understand their present condition, the possibilities dentistry has to offer, and actually have them want that for their own health 
that process takes time and it takes um, getting to know that person, building trust. And I also have to be able to understand what's going on, as I said, again, with confidence. And so for me, the process that I have learned, um, learned after getting out of dental school um, and the process we present throughout the essentials um, is one that is going to be hinged on building a relationship, taking more time. You're still going to do that exam and, and diagnosis, and we're going to give you the opportunity to look at things you've never seen before. But then we're also going to invite that you find the ability to sit down with all the information when the patient's not with you, when you have the freedom to really review it and to think about it, um, not to be busy talking at the same time that you're thinking, which we do all the time in a dental practice, and really work through everything you learned about that person. And even do a process called the diagnostic workup where you're going to actually sit and execute the dentistry basically, but not on the real patient. And today we can do that really, really skillfully on a computer screen. Um, and you can still do it in the analog world. And that diagnostic workup is going to give you a chance to have the confidence that you understand that person's present condition, that you can sit with them confidently and you can work through a treatment plan. And so you're gonna build that plan. And then once you have a treatment plan, then you actually have to do another process we call treatment sequencing. Now you take those things and you have to decide what's the order in which we're gonna do those things. And then you're gonna to start to execute that dentistry. And this process really for me is the key to the fact that uh, I have patients every day who say yes to very complex, very comprehensive dentistry that I know I would not have been helped them move forward with that process of restoring their health before I had a system in place um, that allowed them the time to get to know me, to trust me, to understand what's going on in their mouth, gave me the opportunity to feel really confident in what I was talking to them about and presenting to them, but then also gave me the skills to execute it with that same confidence. So we're going to walk through that just a little, and then Laura's going to dive into one piece of the process in a little more depth for you. So Kylie's a great example of this. Um, you know, when you see Kylie, she's a 16 year old young woman. Um, you meet her for the first time. What we all learned to do really skillfully um, is we learned to go right to where, what do we see that needs, that we know how to fix? Well, she's missing her maxillary laterals. And as it turns out, that's actually what she came in for with her mom um, is to inquire about having implants in those spaces. And the truth of it is, yes, we can, we can offer her a restorative solution. Um, but what I know is that when I look at even just this one photograph, there's some unbelievable complexities to what's going on for this young woman, both from an aesthetic perspective, from a functional perspective, um, there's some really significant, you know, structural issues that have to be resolved to work out this dentistry. Um, and then we have the fact that she's just 16 and we have all of the things that come along with coming up with a lifelong treatment plan for someone who's 16 years old. And, you know, are we ready to make that commitment now? Or do we need to allow her um, to grow, to finish, you know, all of the growth and development, to mature, um, and to have the ability to make some of these really significant decisions, right? So we're going to start there, and then we're just going to build this process. So for me, it really does come down to um, really getting to know that patient, everything about their risks and their present condition. And I look at it in these five boxes. Um, and you'll notice one of the boxes is the patient, getting to know that person. That's really integral. Um, not only for me to have the ability to help someone, I really need to know them. I need to get to understand what they're hoping for around their dental health. I need to get to understand what their current circumstances are in their life that either may facilitate doing the dentistry or actually may present a logistics issue that together we have to problem solve around. 
And then from a technical perspective, I need to have all the information around their aesthetics, their function, all the restorative things that honestly, for most of us is a place we already feel really comfortable. Um, and then all of their health risk assessments. So I'm going to gather the data. And the truth is you can gather the data from an exam perspective, any way you want to, everybody has a different process for how they gather the data. You may want to gather it all at an initial appointment that's longer. Most of the time in my practice, uh, to gather all this data in a complex case, it's going to take us more than one appointment together. Um, and the truth is, I actually prefer it that way. I love to have that other, that second opportunity to come back together with the patient. They have new questions, new curiosities. It's another chance for us to deepen our relationship and we can gather some more data. And you're going to get all of the pieces of this puzzle. And truthfully, we refer to these um, as findings. And one of those is about the person. You know, what's their current understanding of their dental health? What's their hopes for around their dental health? Um, you know, and all of those things that we can listen for around when we're actually asking all the questions we're used to asking about, have you had ortho as a kid? Did you have your wisdom teeth out? You know, we all have our, our things we want to know about people. Um, and I want to know a lot of things about them that aren't necessarily technical. And so the more time I have to spend with them, for me, the easier that is, it evolves, it comes out in those conversations. And so how are we going to gather the aesthetics data? For me, the majority of my aesthetics data is gathered with a, with a camera, right? We're going to do this with photography. Um, I learned with a digital SLR. The truth is today, you can pick up most things that we call a cell phone and you can have a camera that's unbelievably accurate, high pixels, and you can get lots and lots of really phenomenal photography. And we're going to talk with you about the difference between diagnostic photographs, lab communication photographs, and even the fun post-op photographs that we get to take with our patients. But Almost as important as my x-ray machine in my office is my camera and gathering all of the photography that I need. And I'm also going to gather all the functional information. I will tell you for me, this is a place that um, I had to add this to what I was doing with my patients long after I graduated from dental school. I had a great occlusion education at the University of Florida, and it didn't seemed to matter and it didn't make sense. And I was a student and it didn't fit with just getting my requirements to get out of the building. So I didn't pay much attention. And then as a practicing dentist, what I came to understand is that I have just as many patients whose health is at risk because of functional risk problems as it is from caries and perio. And that it's just as important as helping them understand their caries risk and their perio risk and manage it it is for me to help them understand their functional risk. And today when we do an exam and we look for those findings, we are talking about the temporomandibular joints, all of the musculature, the tops of the teeth. And today we do have to add airway and doing an airway screening and understanding how that plays into the long-term health of our patient. And then I'm gonna have some treatment planning decisions. When I go to put a treatment plan together, just like aesthetically, I have to figure out where I want to put maxillary centrals in the face. Functionally, these are the questions that I need to answer. I need to decide for each individual treatment plan what I'm going to do about these five things. And that becomes part of the dentistry that we're planning if we need to change or manage any of these things. So I'm going to put all of that together. I'm going to do my aesthetic exam, my functional exam. Just like all of you, I do a clinical exam for caries. We do a comprehensive periodontal assessment. You know, we're going to take radiographs and look for periapical issues, all of that. Um, and it is amazing to me the volume of data that we actually all collect on all of our patients today so that we can truly understand all of their dental health. And I'm going to put that together and I have a list of findings. Findings are individual pieces of information 
about any one person. These happen to be a few from the photograph you saw of Kylie, right? So aesthetically, um, she had inadequate display at rest. You can't see her centrals when she's at lips at rest. She has an edge to edge anterior occlusion. So this is just a very, very short sampling of what for Kylie is a very long list of findings. So then what do we do with findings? Well, findings get paired together and they become a diagnosis. See, we don't actually treatment plan findings. We treatment plan diagnoses. Sometimes a single finding is the diagnosis, but most often than not, that's not the case, that the diagnosis comes from looking at some combination of different clinical findings in that specific individual and getting the diagnosis or getting to the root cause of why that finding is present is then when we get access to treatment planning. So like for inadequate display at rest, some people have inadequate display at rest because they have super short teeth because they've worn their teeth down. That's not Kylie's case. Some people have inadequate display at rest because the teeth didn't fully erupt. That's actually what happened in Kylie's case. Um, why wouldn't they fully erupt? Well, in her case, she's skeletally class three. So as soon as they hit her lower incisors, they couldn't go anywhere. So if I want to actually solve her tooth display, if I want to improve the aesthetics of her upper front teeth, the truth is I have to have enough data to get to the fact that that's actually a skeletal issue in an AP direction. And in order to give her the aesthetics she wants, we actually have to address that underlying diagnosis. So we're going to gather data. We're going to come up with a list of findings. From findings, we're going to actually come up with a diagnosis. And then from the diagnosis, we get to develop the treatment plan or all the different treatment possibilities. Well, often we can do that in our head. I just sort of talked through some combination of diagnoses based on findings. And I will tell you, even after 35 years, sometimes I actually have to physically interact with the data somehow. And so today that can be on a computer screen or truthfully, I'm old enough that for me, I think about picking up an actual analog articulator and doing the dentistry. I actually have to take it out of my head and I have to get it in the real world for the pieces of the puzzle to come together. Um, and we have a system that we walk people through in, in the Essentials 3 and the Essentials 4 class that lets you do that and take all your data and actually work through it. So we're gonna gather our aesthetic data, we're gonna gather our functional data, then we're actually going to sit down with our mounted models or on a computer screen with a digital articulator. And we're actually gonna take our proposal for how we're gonna change maxillary tooth position and we're actually gonna put it on, overlay it on the person's existing upper model. And then we're going to now create their lower tooth position by actually executing what we want to do functionally for that patient. That process, whether we do it in the analog world or in the digital world, is actually how you answer the question. Do I have to change vertical or am I changing vertical? Because you actually put the upper teeth where you want them, you put the lower teeth where you want them, and then you look and you go, oh, look. I didn't change vertical or I didn't, I did change vertical. Now, while you're doing that process, you do have to be doing it with keeping both your aesthetic and your functional goals in mind. My aesthetic goals of where I want the upper teeth in this person's face when we take it back into the human being. And from a functional perspective, things like leveling occlusal planes and making sure I've actually got my overjet and my overbite. And now I'm going to finalize that whole process. And again, we're doing this as a diagnostic workup. Okay? Through that process, I'm learning about the patient. Sometimes I have things that I think would be great treatment possibilities, but when I'm actually executing it, I realize it's not going to work the way I thought it was going to work in my head. Right? Or I run into a challenge and I'd rather run into it on the models than in the actual patient's head. Right. So now at the end, I've come up with, and I'm going to call this a list of treatment possibilities. Because the truth is in dentistry, as much as we strive to find the perfect treatment plan for our patients, 
There is no such thing. All treatment plans have risks and all treatment plans have benefits. Some of them are so technically risky, we're not gonna present them to our patients. But most of the time, that's actually a subtle variation. So I actually have a bias that the correct treatment plan is the one that that person chooses for themselves at that moment in their life in a relationship with that specific dentist. Because I know that patients choose different treatment plans if you present them six years earlier or six years later. And I know that they choose different treatment plans depending on the dentist they're partnered with, right? But it is ultimately the right treatment plan when the patient says, this is the right balance of risks and benefits for me. This is going to get me to where I'm hoping to go aesthetically, functionally, my health and everything that I want for my, for my oral health. And it fits for me time and fees and lifestyle and all the rest of it. That makes it the right treatment plan when the patient says, this is the one that fits for me, right? how many are you going to present? That's always the conundrum. I always get asked that question when we have this conversation about treatment planning at the Institute and someone will say, how many treatment plans do you present to your patient? And the truth is I actually try really only to present one or two. How do I pare it down to that one or two, right? I've gone through this very complicated decision tree that truthfully only a dentist can go through right? Because we have the knowledge base to do that. Um, and I'm going from findings to diagnosis to treatment possibilities. And then I end up with a whole bunch of different things I could offer the patient as possibilities. I actually try to only offer one or two and I pare it down because I've hopefully gotten to know them, right? By the time I sit down to present that case, I hope I already know whether they would consider ortho again if they're a 50 year old um, or whether they're even remotely interested in removable or they've said, nope, I, whatever I do, I don't wanna have to take my teeth out and put them in a cup. If they say that to me at some point, I'm not gonna present removable. So knowing what of all the treatment possibilities to present is about spending the time getting to know the patient. Right. And, and I usually will say that I'll say, based on our conversations, I'm not going to discuss anything removable with you today. Cause I heard you clearly tell me that that's actually something you hope to avoid for the rest of your life. So let's talk about what the options are that don't include those. Okay. So that's how I pare it down. Okay. And I sit with the patient. I actually, when I go in with a patient, I don't walk in with a treatment plan. I have all of their photographs. I have all of the knowledge about everything of, about them that I've learned from the exam and my own internal process, my diagnostic workup. And I actually walk into my consult room and I ask them if we can take a tour of their mouth and we can review the things we've learned together. And that as we do that, I'm going to talk about what the possibilities are for improving their aesthetics and improving their function, improving their health. And together, we're going to build a treatment plan. And so literally sitting in that room together, we build their treatment plan. And then once they've chosen a treatment plan, I have, I have yet another job left before we execute anything. And that's called treatment sequencing. That's actually typically the way we learned in dental school. First thing we did is we went in the perio clinic and then we got to do some simple operative. And you know, you don't get to do really complex restorative dentistry until way at the end of D3 or D4 a year, okay? That's because dental school is laid out following a treatment sequencing protocol. See, treatment planning and treatment sequencing have totally different orders. We always treatment plan aesthetics first because it sets upper anterior tooth position and gingival position, and then upper posterior tooth and gingival position. And then we treatment plan function because it sets mandibular tooth and gingival position. And it isn't until we actually know where the teeth and the gums are going to be that we can now finally treatment plan the restorative things. Do I need crown lengthening? What materials am I going to use? Do I have enough um, connector size to do a bridge here? All of those structural questions. And then the last thing we treatment plan is actually the biology that carries the perio, the endo. That's actually almost backwards sometimes to the way we treatment sequence. So once we have a treatment plan, we're going to run through that sequence. And treatment sequencing is, is, a, is a combination. It's a relationship-based process. 
because sometimes the treatment sequence is absolutely required based on technical execution, right? We all know there are some procedures that have to come before other procedures, okay? But sometimes treatment sequencing is at a patient request, right? Patients often really want to have one part of their, their teeth fixed before another part, right? Um, sometimes patients have treatment sequencing that has to do with logistics or it has to do with finances. Um, you know, how many times have you had a patient come into your office and say, I'd like to get this done and can you do it really fast because I have somebody getting married in six weeks? right? They're forcing a treatment sequence on you because of timing or, or the reverse. It's amazing how weddings speed it up and slow it down, right? So I have to take what I know technically, and I have to combine it with the patient's requests and their logistics. And now we're going to come up with a treatment sequence. And it's now at this point, finally, where we actually get to execute the dentistry. Right. And so I will tell you that probably one of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I was a younger dentist was to slow down on the front end of my cases, to spend the time to really know I had done the appropriate exam and diagnosis. I'd built the relationship. I'd done the work of the diagnostic workup because then what happens is when you go to execute, then it goes really predictably. And you don't run into things in an operatory that have you want to say oops or something way more colorful than oops. Okay. And then the dentistry is fun when it's predictable. And then the patient's in it with you, you're partnering, and that makes it exponentially more fun. So, and I know you're curious, so I'll just show you really quickly what we ended up doing with Kylie before I turn this over to Laura so she can take a little deeper dive into that concept of occlusal planes and finalizing those occlusal planes. And so Kylie was only 16. She wasn't done growing. We weren't ready yet to have an implant conversation. We weren't ready yet to have an orthognathic surgery conversation, but we needed to do something. And her primary request to me was, I don't wanna wear my teeth on a retainer anymore. I am, have not been a 16 year old girl for a very long time, but I can honor that request. I think that's a fair request to not have your upper laterals come in and out on a Holly retainer. So what did we decide to do? A treatment plan that solves her request, gives her exactly what she's hoping for and did not deprive her of any future treatment plans. She could still come back and do the ortho and the orthognathic. She'd still come back and do the implants later in life. And so we did that by doing one wing resin bonded bridges. Um, and I'll give you one piece of super important clinical advice to take back to your practice. Resin bonded bridges work really, really well in a very specific set of circumstances. Very, very light occlusal forces. That's exactly what Kylie has. She has virtually no overbite and very little overjet. So she's not going to really impact those. And they only ever work with one wing. The second wing, the classic Maryland Bridge design, that second wing is what dooms these to debond. We only ever do these with one wing. And if you do them in the right case where you've got light occlusal forces or you don't have lots and lots of, of um, heavy uh, occlusal contact in the anterior, these will last a long time. So these, these have actually been in Kylie's mouth 11 years. She's still in my practice. She's a 27 year old adult person. Um, and she still has the opportunity to make decisions about other comprehensive treatment plans. And we got there by working through a process together. So with that, I am gonna stop sharing, Laura, and I'm gonna let you take over so you can screen share um, and if you could just take a deeper dive into that little piece about occlusal planes for everybody tonight, I think that would be fabulous. Okay, I think I'm there. Um, yes, I, you know, Lee asked me um, specifically what I had hoped to talk about tonight. And really, it's occlusion, I believe, that has brought me the most satisfaction in dentistry the first half of my career. I kind of can't believe that I'm in the midst of starting the second half, but um, I'd love to share with you a little bit about 
occlusion and the study of occlusion. And then I think I have a nice case to put it to use that I can share with you towards the end. So unfortunately, I don't have any financial disclosures to share. And I'd like to start with L.D. Pankey's three rules of occlusion. Like Lee said, I think we all learned these in dental school at one point or another, but I don't know about you all. I was just trying to move on to the next day and check things off my box in clinic and whatnot. So I think it sort of went over my head. But the first is that with the condyles fully seated in the fossa, all of the posterior teeth should touch simultaneously and the anterior teeth as well, but a lot lighter. And in order to really fully understand this first rule, it's important to understand the concept of centric relation, which is a re described as the relationship between the mandible and the maxilla when the condyle and disc assembly is in its most anterior, superior, and medial position in the glenoid fossa. Not only must the contacts be equal, but the force really should be directed along the long axis of the tooth so that there's less stress to the teeth and the periodontium. The second rule is that when you squeeze your teeth together, neither the, a tooth nor the mandible moves. And in order to do this, we really don't want our contacts to be on the inclines of the teeth. They should be either on um, a cusp or the marginal ridges or in the central fossa. And finally, third, when we move the mandible in any excursion, no back tooth should hit before, harder than, or after a front tooth. So this can be achieved with canine guidance. It can even be achieved with group function if you really think about it. But it's important that the functional movements and the anterior guidance really respect the envelope of function. By having anterior guidance, we can reduce the elevator muscle activity. Remember, the elevator muscles are the temporalis, the masseter, and the medial pterygoid. And we can have more harmony this way between the muscular system and the occlusal system. So these really are the three requirements for long-term stability as we treat our patients. And I like to think of them, Lee mentioned this quite a bit, is not necessarily how we build a restorative case, but how we diagnose a patient's occlusal disease or situation in their mouth. So if we know what isn't working, we can better know how to fix it. That process will go a lot faster for us as dentists. So an occlusal plane, what is an occlusal plane? Well, it's sort of an imaginary surface that touches the incisal edges and the cusps of the occluding surfaces of the posterior teeth. And I think of it, it's better to think of it kind of like a, a piece of paper that's real floaty, not so much like a, a window screen that's flat. And as it touches the teeth, it's just going to rest like that. And as we talk about um, occlusal planes, there are two different types that we learned in dental school. There's the curve of Wils or the curve of speed we'll start with, which is on the sagittal plane. And the curve of speed permits disclusion of the posterior teeth in the protrusive movement. The most common problem when you look at the curve of speed is when the most posterior teeth are actually higher than the anterior teeth. And then in protrusive, um, the, the condylar guidance is on an area where it doesn't have a lot of support from ligaments and the molars are the poorest ones to take the load because of how close they are to the condylar fulcrum. The curve of Wilson on the other hand is in the frontal plane and it's really the arc that goes medial laterally on sim similar cusps on each side. 
And this curve of Wilson guides us in lateral excursions. It takes away the posterior interferences on the non-working or the balancing side. So these three rules of occlusion that we talked about just two slides previously, believe it or not, they're most easily, easily achieved when we have a really nice curve of speed or a really nice curve of Wilson in a case. So let's take a moment and just talk about protrusive guidance. It's really the central incisors that are going to guide us protrusively and the, the leading and the trailing edges specifically. In lateral guidance, we're really looking for the canine or um, the canine and a premolar behind that's going to guide the teeth into that excursive movement and it very smoothly crosses over to the central incisors again. So I'll begin to share um, a case of a patient who I've really grown to love. She came to me about four years ago, maybe before the start of COVID. It's all been very quick since then. And uh, these are Anne's preoperative photos that we took do it during her new patient examination. And her complaint to me was that she had an upper partial that was very tight. She had some difficulty with her fingers and it was almost too tight to remove her upper partial. And on the bottom, she had the complete opposite problem. It just didn't stay, stay steady and it was very loose. She had the lower partial denture made about a year before she came to me, as did she have the three unit bridge that spans from teeth numbers 23 to 25. And you can see that those were ground down quite a bit to meet the discrepancy in incisal edges in the upper anterior teeth. So before we begin to look at her mounted models, I want to go through this small exercise and just look at figure one for a moment. And here we have tooth number three that's super erupted. And we have a space where tooth number 30 is. Now, in Anne's case, she has a partial denture that I'm hoping to fix or remake or make better in one way or another. But we might also have a, an implant we want to restore or a three unit bridge. And when this patient moves the lower teeth forward in protrusive, we're going to ask ourselves, is there going to be a challenge or a posterior interference? And as you can see, there absolutely is. 30 is going to bang right into tooth number three, and they're nearly going to have to open in order to go into excursive movements. So this tooth, as we sit down and like Lee talked about, review photographs or have a discussion about how we want to proceed with a treatment plan. This would definitely have to be part of the treatment plan addressing tooth number three as we address the missing tooth on the bottom. Now let's look at this second scenario where the super erupted tooth is further behind the last tooth in the mandible. Well, actually, when this patient moves forward or back or forward and to the side, there really isn't going to be any posterior interference. So this tooth number two wouldn't necessarily have to be corrected or shortened. One reason you may want to do that is either for aesthetics or also to improve upon the crown root ratio. So we'll go back to Anne's case. And these are my mounted study casts. I usually make two sets of study casts, and I still do like to have models in my hand frequently. Um, I usually keep one set that I just don't ever touch, and the other set I utilize to sort of play in the sandbox or adjust so that I can figure out my options for treating the case. So I've drawn the curve of speed on Anne's models, and if you can just envision what I talked about with that number three super erupted, and we've got the last molar tooth number 31 behind that tooth, you can tell that this is gonna create a huge interference. 
And I begin to wonder if this isn't part of the cause of Anne's denture becoming loose as she chews her food. On her left side, there isn't so much of an interference. Um, the, it, it's almost like the bottom teeth have been shaved down. So as Anne moves into protrusive, we're really not going to have huge interference. However, this may cause a lot of stress upon the maxillary teeth as there's so much discrepancy as she moves forward in protrusive. And here, if we look at the frontal view, we have the curve of speed, which I would say is almost more or less an accordion or a wave. Um, so we talked about the best way to study a patient's occlusion. I think definitely it's mounted models and photographs such as Lee suggested. And I usually work really hard to send both to my laboratory because the, the photographs almost serve as a check to make sure that my models are mounted correctly. It's really important as well that I take a protrusive bite record and you can do that just within about 20 seconds with a thick piece of wax and asking the patient just to move forward and bite down in order to set the condylar guidance and have more of an accurate indication of excursive movements and anterior guidance on our model work. So if this were my second set of models that I was going to use to sort of treatment plan and play in the sandbox, why I might add wax to this and I even might grind some of the teeth, kind of a combination of two additive and subtractive to try to treatment plan the case. So in Anne's uh, instance, Anne and I sat down and like Lee said, we really did just review her treatment. And my initial idea was to treatment plan full coverage crowns on the maxillary arch with a new cast metal framework, upper partial denture, and on the bottom, also full coverage crowns with a removable lower partial denture. And um, Anne was really excited to learn that the aesthetics of her case were going to actually improve even though we were really addressing function. Remember, you've heard that form follows function. And she saw this sort of a get as a gift because at her age, she really wasn't looking to improve the aesthetics of her smile. We did, um, I did have to sort of be on my toes a little bit and um, I'm not the greatest at doing this because once I develop a treatment plan that I think will really serve the patient well, and um, that's not always and frequently not the most expensive treatment plan, but it's a treatment plan that might fit the patient's objectives and their financial desires and that I believe will be easy to maintain and have an excellent prognosis with stability. Well, in Anne's case, she did wish for the financial to component to be less. So we did decide to do some resins on the lower arch versus full coverage crowns. We also actually decided, and this made me very nervous, to use the framework of the new lower partial denture, which actually fit very well, and just redo the acrylic and the teeth on the full lower denture. So it was important, I think this communication and knowing where your boundaries are, where um, you know that you can successfully do a good job. It's like you kind of work together and collaborate to come up with the perfect treatment plan. I wanted to point out these awesome Siltec putty matrices that Philip Gold made for me. And they really helped me to understand on the left here, how much I had to reduce and super erupted teeth in the posterior. So I was able to just sort of make a gross reduction and then prep my crowns, prep the teeth from there. The Siltec on the upper right 
that helped guide me and do my most conservative preparations by understanding how much tooth structure I had to remove for the new uh, crown work, the bridge work, or actually how much I needed to build the teeth up in that case. And then we made these um, kind of a second option for provisionalization, which I'll talk about in a moment on the lower right, uh, to um, help me rework or soup up her existing lower partial denture so that we could sort of use that as a provisional and gain underst uh, some understanding of how that was going to work for us. So these are my preparations. I will say they were a bit challenging, uh, particularly the upper molars. Um, and let's see, I think, so here's my provisionals. And my treatment sequence, as Lee talked about, was that I had decided I was going to do upper arch provisionalization, quickly followed by lower arch provis provisionalization, and then I was going to deliver the lower arch with an upper arch try-in, and finally, upper arch delivery. And I thought this would work the best for this case. So this is my single unit uh, provisional on the maxillary arch. I now have a provisional on the three anterior teeth, 23 to 25. And for the lower partial denture, what I ended up doing was just roughening with it with an acrylic burr and using um, a um, round burr to cut some indents into the existing acrylic. I just used jet acrylic then to meld onto the denture and I block carved some posterior teeth for her. The posterior teeth weren't the most gorgeous, I admit, but um, they did have really nice centric stops and they were free from any interferences in the posterior. And you remember her interference on the uh, lower right. By the way, part of the other change that we made in our treatment plan was not to redo tooth number 31 because we wanted that to fit well with her metal framework or continue to fit well with her metal metal framework. So this is a series of photographs that I've tried to get into the habit of sending to my laboratory with some images of what Anne looked like in protrusive guidance and lateral guidance in the provisionals so that as we mounted, I actually take either a scan or impressions of my provisionals. As we mounted those, we could sort of check our mounting against the photographs. Sometimes I'll even send short videos of moving into protrusive and lateral excursions. And as I said, I do like to have sort of a plan B for provisionalization. Um, I guess I'm a little weird sometimes as I get to the day one way to provisionalize strikes me as better than another. And so I like to have two different options in my hand. And that's what those Siltec putty matrices were for the posterior and the lower partial denture. This is Anne's final case. And um, as we were nearing the end and the fabrication of the upper arch, I actually received a call from Denise at the laboratory, and she said, you know, Laura, would you not consider doing a single unit zirconia roundhouse for Anne? I think it would be really nice, and I think it would work out about the same financially. And um, what do you think Anne would think of that? And I thought about it, and I thought, oh, I, I don't know. These are really large spaces in between the abutment teeth. And I just don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Um, but then I started to think about Anne's age. I started to think about her cognitive ability, her excellent home care, which was just, she was just improving upon every time I saw her. And I did offer this to Anne and she said, you know what, I'm really loving this provisional with nothing on the roof of my mouth. And that's what I'd like to do. So once again, I, I had to pivot. And um, we did end up doing a single unit on the top. 
And these are, there's my new bridge on the lower anterior, and these are new denture teeth and acrylic on her it, relatively new, but not new to me, lower partial denture. And we were just floored by the stability of the lower partial denture. I mean, it just never used to sit in her mouth before. And it was just solid once the occlusion was fixed. I didn't even tighten the clasp. The metal framework just fit beautifully as it was. So now I've mounted her post-operative models. And just for tonight's lecture, I was curious about comparing my curve of speed. You see, we lost that large interference in the posterior <clears throat> on the right-hand side. <clears throat> Pardon me, and we have a less of a steep curve of Wilson on Anne's left. If we end up with a curve of speed in which the anterior is lower than the posterior, we do run into problems with the lower mole, premolars, rather, hitting the upper cuspids in protrusive guidance. And if we end up with the anterior being really, really high and the back being low, well then that's a lot of stress on the anterior teeth and a lot of separation in the posterior teeth as you move forward. Here we're showcasing the curve of Wilson. And I, I like to think too of the curve of Wilson, not just as um, a plane on the lower arch, but also thinking about how this plane accom or accommodates rather the maxillary teeth. As we think about the curve of Wilson, there are a couple different ways that we can change the curve of Wilson. We can change its steepness by making the anterior guidance steeper. And if we do that, then the lingual cusps on the non-working side have the ability to be taller. Another way that we can change our um, curve of Wilson is that we can either shorten or lengthen the lingual cusps on the upper arch in the posterior. So if we lengthen the lingual cusps on the top, well, then we're gonna get a steeper curve of Wilson. And if we make them shorter, I don't know how I'm doing here on the camera, why then we're gonna have a flatter curve of Wilson. So this is Anne's before and after. And remember Anne came to me really just wanting me to tighten the clasps on the upper partial denture and to either mess with the clasps on the lower denture or to make her a new one because she was so frustrated with it. And Anne was able to, um, was open to hearing me talk about the challenges with her occlusion and to understand that if I simply made a, a new lower partial without addressing these planes of occlusion, that I really wasn't going to be any more successful than her previous dentist. So her words to me were that she feels so much better about her teeth now than what she did before she came to see me. She said, I can even eat corn on the cob. And in Lancaster County, that's probably the best compliment <laughs> that I receive. Whenever anyone tells me that, I tell them, to not tell their friends that because I don't wanna be held accountable with new dentures or whatnot to promise my patients that they can eat corn on the cob. But I thought it was pretty sweet. And as I was doing this presentation, I did look up a little bit of research that I thought was really interesting that I just wanted to share. The studies are listed at the bottom of the slide. And the first one was a study that was completed in 2013 with just 50 young adults. They um, measured the occlusal curvature of the mandibular arch with a Broderick flag. And then they uh, had did a masticatory performance test actually with peanuts. And they found that the best chewing ability occurred when patients had flatter planes. 
So we just talked about how to change the planes of occlusion. And it was the flatter planes that were much more functionally successful for patients. The second study I really loved um, is more recent. It's from 2021 and had over 300 patients that were age 65 and older. And I treat a lot of older patients because <clears throat> I think partly because I'm a third generation dentist, but also because Lancaster County is really a popular retirement. It's a popular place to live in retirement. And this second study, it wasn't mixability and masticatory performance. It was actually cognitive function and masticatory ability test with a T-scan. And it was found that the greater the balance anteriorly and posteriorly. So in other words, if the posterior um, dentition was maintained, the cognitive function was higher. And they also deduced that tooth loss is a risk factor for reducing cognitive function. And I started to think about this and how I may be impacting my patients um, as serving them as young adults and carrying them through adulthood, or even in serving some of my elderly patients who are already struggling with dementia or Alzheimer's or forgetfulness. And it was pretty cool to think that, well, if this is on to something, perhaps, um, you know, it just is one more reason that occlusion sort of juices me. I also wanted to mention something that a mentor and a good friend of mine, Brad Portnoy in Rockville, Rockville Center, New York, said to me when I was first starting practice and I was beginning to sit down and have these review of findings and um, start to discuss treatment plans and I was struggling with it. And he said to me, you know, Laura, um, one thing that I learned and I like to impart upon my team and my patients is that nutrition is really the most important in two stages of our life. The first being our infancy and the second being the latest stages of our life. And one thing my father told me when I came to practice with him and he is now retired was that one of the best gifts I could give my patients is to help them maintain or restore them to their dentition so that as they entered their last stages of life, they didn't have to deal with dental emergencies or a difficult time functioning. So I hope I've shared a little bit. Um, I'm still learning about occlusion. I'll never stop. <laughs> it's one of those things um, that I think I'll probably never master, but um, I'm very, very excited about it. And I think it makes a profound difference for my patients. I think I, um, I think my patients become my missionaries a lot due to occlusion and not necessarily how well I match tooth number eight to tooth number nine. It's really been very satisfying and fulfilling for me. Well, thank you all so much for being with us. I hope that this was uh, fun and informative. Um, thank you, Laura, for doing it. I had a great time putting it together with you and looking at that really spectacular case. Um, and um, hopefully we will see everybody again on a future Panky Institute webinar, um, our courses at uh, Panky Online, which is online.panky.org as well, or on Restorative Nation. So we have lots of web-based uh, education that you can get great CE um, and great learning through the Panky Institute. Hope everybody has a fantastic evening, um, and we'll see everybody again sometime soon.